Matt, nice to meet you. So stoked to have you on the Mark Devine Show. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. Look forward to it. Yeah, no, I'm pretty stoked. So you're in Chicago. How's the weather out there right now? You know, it's bipolar here. I feel like, you know, one week where it's 50 degrees and everyone's excited and wearing shorts. And then the next minute it goes back to 20 degrees and a snowstorm. So I feel like, you know, we're still yeah. at that, that point right now in time where we got to just battle it out for another month or so. Yeah, my family is in upstate New York and I'm from there and it's it's not dissimilar. Like it's been these wild swings this year. So Yeah, it's been pretty crazy. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't know if you've, how much time you spent in Chicago, but summertime Chicago is, it's pretty remarkable, special place to be. I've only been there a couple times. I was uh, I was with Arthur Anderson for a couple of years, and they have their big training center outside of Chicago. So we yep. spent some time there. And then I remember once with a friend of mine who was a trader, uh, we went to um, we did a race from Michigan City to Chicago, a sailboat race, oh, wow. and, and then got to hang out on a like a really fancy wealthy yacht. That was quite fun. That was when wow. I was like twenty one years old. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> fond memories. So so um. Tell us a little bit about your background. I saw, you know, I know just from my research, you were NFL with the Bears. I remember we were talking before we started my my um, fond memories of Refrigerator Perry and Pat Man and what, you know, Walter Payton, what an incredible team back in the 80s. But so what, what's yep. your story? And tell us a little bit about your, your, your growing up and getting into football and your career and all that. Absolutely. You know, I so kind of the backstory, the shortened version is um, – you know, I grew up in the suburb outside of Chicago, about 35 minutes from downtown Chicago, where I currently live now. Uh, two wonderful parents, um, you know, but for me, life wasn't always so easy growing up, even though I had two wonderful parents that kind of provided me and my younger brother with everything we needed to grow up and really be fine young men and make a difference in society. I went the opposite direction. Um, you know, I always say you are who you hang out with. Show me your five closest friends. I'll show you right. where your future's headed. And for me, you know, I went down a very dark path. Par- you know, path, Mark, I, um, you know, full blown out drug addict, uh, done every single drug you possibly think of besides heroin. I think a lot of people that don't know that backstory about me are pretty shocked. I wrote about it extensively in my first book, Winning Plays, which was published in 2016. But long story short, even though I excelled in football, baseball was actually my best sport growing up. So I was projected to get drafted straight out of high school, skip college, go straight to the major leagues. But I got kicked off my baseball team because I got caught one afternoon I still remember it very vividly. It was 3.45 p.m. on a Tuesday, and I, I stayed behind because I saw all this cash that was sitting in one of my friends, my teammates' wallets, oh and thought God. about in the back of my head how, you know, how many drugs I could buy with that money. So stole that money, got caught, kicked off the baseball team, lost my dream right there. Um, obviously, I was able to turn around my life uh, after a lot of trial and error and so much unconditional love from my parents and the support system in the school, almost to the point where they were going to expel me. Right. If I didn't go to a drug treatment facility to start that process to work on myself. And it was in that moment, Mark, with really the first month within that drug treatment facility. Uh, you know, this is the longest I've been sober for this point in time. And I just came home one evening and had a conversation with my father. And it was that epiphany, that moment in time that drastically just changed my life. Uh, the rest what, do you remember what was it about that moment? Like, what was the conversation? You know, was there like a heart opening? Was it a concept that, you know finally landed? Like, what was that pivotal? You know, everyone asks me that. And I I think that it's so hard to kind of quantify and, you know, really look back in that moment. I I think first and foremost, to give you some context, my father's one of the strongest human beings I ever met. Mm -hmm. You know, if I ask a group of people, let's say, like, who do you think the strongest person I ever came, you know, encountered in the game of life? And they'll instantly say a 350 pound offensive lineman that wanted to rip my head off playing football, right? In college or in the NFL. I say wrong, it's my father. Uh, blue collar work ethic. Uh, he was an iron worker for over 40 years in the city of Chicago. So built the Sears Tower. Now it's the Willis Tower, I believe. Wow. Um, so all the architecture in Chicago just, you know, woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, you know, went swimming, did everything he could, worked seven days a week, provided for his family. So to see my father in that moment just break down in tears and just say that, you know, hey, me and your mom can't go on like this living anymore. Right. I think that had something to do with it. And then right. also me being sober right? I had a little bit more clarity about kind of like, this isn't the life that I want to live for my future. This isn't the life that I want to live. Uh, and, and really, you know, I, I didn't want to hurt my mother and father anymore. I saw the tears that I put in my mother's face. Right. Right. So, oh, you know, I was able to use football after that moment, you know, realizing, okay, okay, I don't have baseball anymore, but I still do have football. I didn't kick, get kicked off the football team. So right. for me, even though I like the game of football, it wasn't my my true love. Like baseball was my true love. I loved that game since I was five years old. 
Um, and even though I excelled at football, my dad played football at Auburn University, so I had it in my background in family history. Um, you know, for me, I used it as an outlet. I used it as mm-hmm. a way out. And for me, you know, it was that moment in time when I had that conversation with my father where I was like, you know, I have to get a Division One college scholarship for football. Right. And, and that was the process for me, Mark. I, one year later, 19 Division One college scholarships, went to Indiana, great career there, led me to my, my short time with the hometown team, the Chicago Bears, get hurt my very first game playing with the Bears. <laughs> you you covered game. a little bit of history there real quickly. So you went to, you said Indiana? Indiana. So, and I went right. to Indiana, you know, because that was a big, I don't know if you're a, a college football fan, but not so much, you know, I had, let's just say like Georgia who just won back-to-back national championships and then Tennessee. So I had, I had scholarship offers after I turned around my life and got sober and, you know, dedicated myself to getting stronger, faster, and right. uh, hanging out with new friends that were going to help keep me sober and really keep me on the path. Um, you know, when I had all these scholarship offers, everybody was like, oh, he's going to Georgia. He's going to Tennessee. Like right. it's, it's for sure. But I went to Indiana, which, you know, a nice way of, st- they suck at football. Like they, they <laughs> haven't been good for, for so long. Um, recently they've started to turn the corner, but then just when you think they're turning the corner, they kind of go yeah. back, but it's a basketball state, basketball school. So why but I went you? to Indiana because I met a man by the name of Terry Hetner, who was the head coach at the time. And I wrote about him extensively in my first book. I wrote about him a little bit in the, my new book, Culture is the Way, which just came out February 1st. And uh, he just made a tremendous difference in my life, Mark. I mean, that was my my front row view of what transformational leadership is, about how right. one human being can alter the course of your life for the rest of your life by just the way that they lead and impact your life from how they live their life day to day. I love that. And so many people have that um, an interaction with a transformational leader like that as a mentor or coach or right or just an inspiration and and yet at the same time i think it's still kind of rare right? right like for for me i didn't find that until after i graduated from college and i was in new york working toward my mba and cpa and i started a martial arts program and there was a grandmaster 10th degree founder of this global um style of martial art you know out of out of traditional J- japanese karate and he was a zen master and suddenly boom right there was there was my mentor, right? right? Who, who was so different than anyone else and taught me so much and, and had that, that quality of transformational leadership, which was the ability to transform others, right? Just through your presence and through your words and through your care. And I That's think a lot of it too, and you probably experienced this throughout your, the course of your life at some point, I think part of it too, is being receptive to that. That's right. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, cause I feel like when, even before I met Terry Hepner, you know, there was a lot of incredible people in my life that had unbelievable leadership qualities that really did everything they could to pour into my life. I just wasn't in that place in my life where right. I was receptive to it. You weren't re- and, you and I weren't think ready. that that had something that a, that a big factor, I think, to play into that as well. Sure. Yeah. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. It doesn't mean there's not other teachers waiting. Right. But you weren't ready. And I wasn't ready for that matter. Right. That's awesome. So what did you learn from him? You know, I learned, I mean, literally everything I can. Um, you know, I think from when you look at like, as far as what leadership consists of, how do you turn around a struggling organization, in this case, program, you know, in the football context, uh, because when he did come over, uh, you know, we won one game the year prior, right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, two years later, we're playing in the in an Insight Bowl in Tempe, Arizona against Oklahoma State, right? Mm-hmm. And it had nothing to do with, you know, we weren't getting five-star, four-star recruits or some of the best high school athletes in the country. Uh, it was solely, you know, predicated on one man's vision, hope, and dream of rebuilding a program and really changing the foundational mechanism of how we behaved and also our perception. You know, it wasn't so much about the old Indiana. Indiana sucks at football. Indiana's, you know, going to get annihilated by Ohio State and Michigan. Like he really be- had us believing from the deepest levels of our heart that, you know, we could go out there and compete for a Big Ten championship. Right. And he, even if that never happened, um, you know, I, I think that him setting the foundational core and the mechanism and the process of what it takes to be great and compete at a very high level was really what he just did such a great job at. And he was right. able to do something as far as set very clear expectations and really bring out the best in others. But then on the flip side of that, he also knew how to love, serve and coach every single day. Right. So he knew when to be hard on you, but he also knew the importance of situational leadership, that how Matt receives my coaching and teaching is not how Jake right, receives my coaching and teaching. And I think that he just had so much self-awareness uh, and he led with so much empathy and vulnerability. I think that his ability to impact was extraordinary. That is cool. I mean, I love it. You've already, 
you know, I'm a student of leadership, I actually get my, my doctorate right now in global oh, leadership wow. chain. You've already, you already referenced a couple powerful leadership, three leadership principles. One is transformational, which we talked about. The other is transactional, right. uh, Ken Blanchard and, and some others where, you know, the situation or situational, which is really both combination transactional, as well as, um, um, you know, leader member exchange where the individual and the, and the, and the leader are shaping the leadership experience right. Right? and then servant leadership, right? Which is really about, you know, your team, your, your, your company, your, your staff. I mean, you're there right. to serve them, not lead them. Right. That's and I cool. think so much of leadership, and I learned this really from Terry Hepner as well. I think, you know, so much of leadership is outwardly facing, you know, right. is how do you inspire others? How do you, you know, rally up others? How do you help others in the organization accelerate to achieve the strategy and, Right. You know, it's always outwardly facing is which I think at the end of the day, it is a big part of it. But I think, you know, what I learned from Terry Hepner is that in order to fully impact another life, you first have to impact your life That's right. and become a lifelong learner. And I think that he just, he really showed me the importance of that. You know, I talk a lot about, you know, this idea of transformational leadership. And I think, you know, a lot of people do, it's been around, it's been studied so much research, but I think at the end of the day, all transformational leaders that create some type of transformation in a team or organizational setting they have this ability to really just have deep levels of not only vulnerability and empathy, but their, their humility That's as right. far as they may be the smartest one in the room. They may make the most money in the room. They may have the most incredible experience in the room, but you, they would never hear, you would never hear it out of their mouth. Right. You know, I think how they carry themselves and they truly are lifelong learners. And because of that, they're able to you know, really understand the complexities of a situation that they're in which really helps their ability to enhance their level of impact. Right. I love that. So, so great leaders, like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Great leaders understand that you want to be the change that you want to see in your team. Right. Or in your Absolutely. culture. Couldn't agree more. Right. And so once you can uh, embody that and own it, right. And then shape it with your vision and then your, and your interactions, but mo mainly how you show up. Right. Leading by example. And, and that, you, I know you talk about this too, Mark. I mean, I mean, that's the one thing we all control, right? That's like right. we don't, we don't control the market. We don't control, you know, a pandemic completely shutting down the world. We, we can't control, you know, some of the, the trials and tribulations that we all face and encounter throughout the game of life. But, you know, the one thing we all can control is how we decide to show up for that particular day. Right. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things, cause I, I have a lot of organizations and leaders in really every sector, they'll reach out when they're going through a digital transformation or a cultural transformation or some type of big change at scale. And, you know, one of the very first things is it's always, how can we, sh you know, create a maybe shortcut or how can we look to maybe shorten the process to get to where we want to go, the end destination. And mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, if you first, still, you know, can't look in the mirror and say, is every single leader within your organization living and breathing your values or whatever you're trying to instill and really bring out the rest of the organization, you're not going to get wherever you want to go. Right. Right. And, and it starts right there as goes the behavior of the leader. So mm -hmm. goes the behavior of the rest of the organization. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. And I just think that so many complications that we see in the business world is really predicated from that. Yeah, I would agree. And my last book um, is called staring down the wolf. And the whole premise was that leaders kind of need to, really get out of their own way. Often they're the blocking energy or the blocking force in a team. hundred percent. Right. And so they've got to do the, the shadow work and overcome their biases. And, you know, like you use the term vulnerability. I use the term authenticity. They've got to like become incredibly authentic. Right. Instead of wearing all the masks of perfectionism and righteousness and judgment and, you know, thinking that they've got all the models and tools and strategies, you know, and they're, and they're bringing it to the team. Absolutely. With the teams these days, especially people becoming more and more aware as information gets diffused and now we have AI and everything is, is the, you know, you can't hide anymore. No, you can only, you can only hide from yourself. <laughs> right. And right. even now I feel like it's harder to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I use the term background of obviousness. All of that stuff that you have is in the back, it's in your background of obviousness, meaning it's obvious to anybody else who's around you, but completely hidden from your own view. That's why right. they call it the shadow, you know, in, in, uh, in the therapy world. Well, that's fascinating. So tell us about um, your short career at the Chicago Bears. Yeah. So after, you know, I went to Indiana and to kind of finish that story of Terry yeah. Hepner, you know, he ended up actually passing away during my time in Indiana. Oh, no kidding. And, you know, he had a brain tumor and, 
you know, it was ironic because that was really, you know, really one of the, the main reasons why I went to Indiana, even though I fell in love with the campus and my teammates, and I, I don't regret the decision one bit. Um, that was a, not only my first experience with really death, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it was just, you know, so detrimental to my life in so many ways when he passed away. But, you know, because of, you know, that and everything, it really, you know, did in, ignite a fire inside of me and had a great career there. So to answer your question specifically, which gets to this, this big moment of, you know, former drug addict turns around his life. Uh, his guidance counselor told his two parents that he'd be dead or in prison by his 18th birthday. Finally gets an opportunity to play for the hometown team, the Chicago Bears. And, you know, actually, Mark, like yourself, I, I grew up a 1985 diehard Chicago Bears fan. Did you? You know, so I used to run around with 34 jersey thinking I'm Walter Payton, you know, <laughs> breaking breaking my mother's glassware and, and her, just driving her absolutely crazy. Um, so getting this moment with the Bears was truly unique and special, you know, just to that very first time of walking in the locker room and um, being next to Brian Urlacher, first ballot Hall of Famer and Lance Briggs. I mean, guys that I grew up watching and studying was just truly a remarkable experience. But, you know, for me as a rookie, right, you start as a four string mm -hmm. and you have to work your way up the depth chart, right? And if you're lucky, you may have some type of role on special teams if you even make the team. Right. So during training camp, I'm having a great camp. I work from fourth team. Uh, working my way up the depth chart behind Lance Briggs, uh, who I think will be in the Hall of Fame one of these years coming up here shortly. Um, but my very first game playing the San Diego Chargers out in beautiful, sunny Sa San Diego, California, um, I get hurt right before halftime. A big 320-pound offensive lineman comes crashing down on my left ankle. Jeez. And I heard, a, I heard a pop, so I didn't know what was – you know, going on there. But as I mentioned, my father is one of the strongest human beings I ever met. My growing up, my father would always say, if bone is not sticking out, don't you dare think about coming out of that game. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I listened to him, you know, so I kept playing obviously during halftime, got a short shot at toward all, you know, so I'm feeling good with some of the medication they gave me. Uh, and I finished that game with six tackles. So I had a great first game, but the next morning I woke up and uh, I actually fell when I went to go put pressure on my left foot because the I just couldn't support it. Um, and that was really the end of my my football playing career. Long story wow. short, I tore a bone completely off my ankle. They Ouch. told me I was going to be out for nine months on injured reserve, but that I wasn't able to fully run and cut on a dime like a linebacker needs to until really three and a half years. So wow. that, that was really the end of my career, even though they said, hey, you might come back probably around month seven, month eight, I was like, just there, there's no way with how my ankle is currently feeling. There's no way it's going to be ready in two months. So, right. uh, unfortunately that was the end of my career. And, um, you know, it was, it was that short, literally one game, one dream, one opportunity. It was gone in the blink of an eye. That's incredible. Yeah. It just shows you how, you know, life can change on a dime with one, with one move, literally <laughs> right. one wrong move. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a saying going out there. I mean, the, the NFL stands for the National Football League, but, you know, it's really, you know, what it stands for is not for long. Not for long. You know, the, <laughs> the average career is three years. Is that right? Uh, you've yeah. probably seen the studies about brain health and, uh -huh. you know, traumatic brain injury and all the stuff that they're kind of bringing to the table now about the risks of playing the game of football. So it's a very violent sport, and you kind of know that going into it. But, you know, never in a million years did I think that, you know, I was going to just get one opportunity in a preseason Right. Uh, you know, because before you think, hey, I'm going to have the seven, eight year NFL career. If I could just ride that out, I'll be I'll, I'll be set. So will my family. Um, right. So that was a very it was a very dark time for me. It was it was very uh, I deemed it as one of my biggest failures, Mark, even though you can't control getting injured in a very violent sport. I truly viewed it as a failure in my life. Interesting. Well, there's no such thing as failure, only failure to learn. And it sounds like you learned a lot from that. I did and apply it right to help others uh, in terms of leadership and cultural development. So what was the, tr you know, what was the journey from, from that kind of nadir, that, that uh, dark valley of the soul moment to um, coming out of that in your own hero's journey to become a, you know, I'd be lying if I said it was myself or that I, I took the initiative to learn from this particular dark lesson in my life. Um, I, I just had so many great people. Just like when I was 16 and went down the wrong path, it was because of the people I associated with. And then when I got injured, it was because of the people I associated with that helped me, you know, really turn around my life and catapult me to a new level. Uh, you know, and my life changed when I got asked to speak at a leadership event by Stedman Graham, who's been Oprah Winfrey's boyfriend for well over a decade, I believe. Um, and I met him in a charity event the month prior. So when he found out that I got injured, 
you know, his team asked if, hey, Stedman speaking at a leadership event downtown Chicago, you'd only speak for 15 minutes. We'd love to have you. And my first reaction, Mark, was I get the hell out of here. Like, you know, I'm terrified to speak in front of 10 people. <laughs> Not only that, I got a D in public speaking in college. <laughs> Right. Not only that, I'm still depressed, currently in a walking boot and still thinking about, am I ever going to be able to play the game of football again in my life? Something that I wanted to do. So I hung up the phone and I realized, and I remember very vividly walking around downtown Chicago and just thinking, you know, what the hell, what do I have to lose? So long story short, I, I literally called his team back and did that one event. And that was that one event, taking that one opportunity that really changed the whole trajectory of the, the rest of my life. By doing right. that one event and word of mouth from that event got around. I think there was an executive in the audience from AT&T or uh, one of the big companies. And, and that really started, you know, me kind of traveling the world, sharing in the beginning, it was more inspirational, sharing more of my story, overcoming adversity. Uh, and then obviously that translated into the lessons of business I learned from the game of football and how do those apply to specifically leadership and culture. That's fascinating. Yeah. I remember, I mean, that's very similar to my story. I was a, I uh, transitioned off active duty and um, got into the business world. My first business was a, a microbrewery, Coronado Brewing Company, but I simultaneously started the website NavySeals.com, which was providing, you know, recruiting information and also training information and selling gear and stuff. And uh, I had a company, you know, reach out to me through NavySeals.com and say, hey, can you come talk to us about the Navy SEALs and some of the principles to make them who they are? And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh you know, and I had one of the same probably cycle go through my yeah. head. Like, I'm not a speaker. I don't know. Right. And that's terrifying. You're right. And, and I people remember, do this. The Hotel people Dell. People do it was this. like, <laughs> what? It was a national pen company of all things. And um, wow. Yeah, there I was standing up in front, like very first speech, standing up in front of several hundred people. And it was horrible. <laughs> so it was mine. That's why <laughs> when I, I little, like, clapped, yay, and I was back like, at it, it's, it's wow. remarkable to think that like, you know, someone was in the audience and found something that they wanted to share with their team, you know, right. because I mean, looking back at it, like now I would grade myself. That was probably like an F minus, you know, like it was just, <laughs> I had no idea what From I was their doing. Perspective, you know, um, audiences or individuals are very gracious. You know, you're sitting up there thinking that they've got their knives out and they're just like throwing mental darts at you. Right. The reality is they're thinking, wow, what a fascinating human being and an interesting story. Right. And I think what it was, Mark, you, you hit on it. I, I think, you know, authenticity, right? Like I had no notes, no, no cards, no PowerPoint at that point, you know? So for me, it was just really speaking for the heart. And I think that that's awesome. That's the best know, way, by the way. Yeah. That's I think that way. it's, it's, I think that's, it connects with people. I think that, right. you know, even if you were never a drug addict or, you know, with your story, right? Like even if you were never in a, a seal, right? Like, I mean, there's so many lessons that you're probably able to share with your story that can impact people with given with where they are in their journey. And I think the authenticity just really just, it really impacts people on a deeper level, I think. I 100% agree. Yeah. Authenticity is everything, you know, being able to, to really tell your story without sugarcoating and glossing it over and, and recognizing that people are going to connect, you know, right. because you're opening your heart to them. Right. But it's not hard to do, especially for, um, you know, leaders, the way leadership was taught and the way our our culture at, at large or writ large developed with that kind of staunch individualism, um, uh, patriarchal and, you know, um, in, you know, kind of the Puritan ethic, right. Which tries to project, you know, strength and, and um, weakness is not, you know, acceptable, especially for the role models or the family leaders or for the corporate leaders. So right. people have uh, leaders have difficulty with that. They do. Um, and I, I did too. I mean, I would, I would be lying if I said, Hey, from, right from the get go, I, I was sharing the most vulnerable aspects of my life and my story. I'd be, it, it's a lie. You know, I think that it really, I mean, I think I, I started in that, that very first engagement back in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, that was that, that, you know, when that very first speech was, but I think as time went on, I think even a year from that very first speech, I remember very vividly, a close friend of mine said, Matt, you know, you're still kind of sugarcoating it. You're still, you're still live, leaving bits and pieces out. You're not mm -hmm. giving the, it's, it's more about you. You're thinking about what do I want to share? What do I not want to share without, I remember very vividly, a, a, a very important point that really changed my, my ability to stand on stage and deliver a message, um, which was, it's not about you. It's about the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that that perception and that mindset shift really just changed everything for, for me. 
you know, mm -hmm. because now I, it was, you know, how am I looking on stage? What if I stutter here? What if I mess up here? What if I forget what I'm going to say here? What if I mess up this story? It was all about how can I add value and impact this audience for this particular 30 or 60 minutes. And that, that changed my, it changed everything for me. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, your recent book is on culture. Culture is yep. the way. So I'm, I assume we're talking about organizational culture or team yep. culture. Um, how, you know, how did you get interested in this and, and, you know, where did that work kind of arise from? Yeah. So I got really, I mean, so I've always been fascinated by what makes great teams and great organizations better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. I, so I've always been fascinated by that. Even, even during my dark days, like I would always even study, you know, even, even when I was doing drugs still and almost throwing away my life completely, I was still fascinated by you know, the, the, the 85 bears, I was still fascinated by the Chicago bulls, the run they had, you know, the dynasty, um, you know, but really what, what started with me, I think about first from 2010 to 2012, I was strictly what you would call like an inspirational speaker. And I hate that term. I hate being labeled as a motivational speaker yeah, yeah. Uh, because now there's obviously so much more to it, but in the beginning that that's really all I was doing, just traveling around, you know, just really inspiring and sharing more of my story. And what happened was there was one particular engagement where uh, they wanted me to talk about leadership and culture and, and how to build a great team because the audience was 450 leaders uh, in, in the Fortune 100 space. And they wanted me to talk about what, what are all the lessons I accumulated from the game of football because there's so many about right. teamwork and perseverance and culture and leadership and how does that apply to their particular industry. Mm -hmm. And that connection not only fascinated me, but I realized that with how they received that message, that was telling me then right there that this is something that I think a lot of business leaders in the business world are really going to cling to and connect to because mostly everybody is a sports fan to some degree, even if it's not football, right? You have some sport that you grew up watching probably, even if you're not a sports fan, you can more than likely still connect the dots. Um, so kind of like when I started in 2010, I, you know, word of mouth, I, I just started to gain some traction and momentum. And next thing you know, I wasn't just delivering my, my story or sharing an inspiring message. I was going around pri primarily with leadership teams, C-level executives in the business world, talking about leadership and culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously as time went on, the need for, hey, culture is important, all this talk about culture, but, but how do you build culture? Right. Because right. I think there's a big not only misconception of what culture is, mm -hmm. but I think there's also a, you know, false connotation of, of how do you build culture? Right. I think a lot right. of people think that it's putting down on paper like, hey, here's our strategy. Right. Right. Where there's so many more moving pieces to it. And I truly believe, like I put in the book, that football coaches are some of the best culture builders out there. Mm -hmm. You know, think of Bill Belichick. Think of Nick Saban. Um, you know, in the book, I talk about Tom Allen, who's the current Indiana head coach, Mel Tucker at Michigan State you know, PJ Fleck at Minnesota. I mean, I could just go on and on and on um, about, you know, why football coaches are some of the best culture builders out there. So in the book, I, I really make this, this correlation of not only are football coaches some of the best culture builders, but in the business world, here's what you can take away from them and some mindset and perception shifts that can really make a difference. Yeah. It's interesting. While you were talking about that, um, I was thinking about the SEALs and like the New Zealand All Blacks and and other organizations where um, the culture gets so deeply embedded into the organization and all at all levels of leadership that that it go it, it goes well beyond the leader, right? And so you don't have to have a Belichick or you know a, a powerful, forceful leader to come in and transform culture, because the organization is the culture right. or becomes the culture, regardless of the leader. And you can have you can have good leaders and bad leaders, but they're not going to radically disrupt the the nature of the culture because it's it's so baked into that system how, right. how does that happen is that just a matter of time and consistency you know like with the all blacks and the seals what's your perspective on that i i think it is time and consistency but i i think that you know you'd be very surprised i mean i, I you i know you've seen it and i've i've seen it too i i agree with the sentiment that you know as far as if if a foundational core has been built yeah. Right. A new leader can come in and kind of they can just ride off to the sunset, if you will, because the the systematic foundational core of that organization or that team has already been built and cultivated. Right. But somewhere along the way, there was probably more than likely a leader. Right. That was a Terry Hetner or was like your mentor that impacted your life that came right. along and really transformed the entire organization and the people within it. 
Right. And or, and I think, or it started that way, you know, like exactly. the, seals, the seals were started with that, exactly. you know, that kind of energy and they never lost it. I mean, they have, they've had some rocky roads, but they've always been able to, because of their history and because of the strength of, of the leaders at all level idea, they yeah. were able to kind of write the ship. Yeah, but I think I, I think the the seals. I would say I think that you know some NFL teams. I mean, you know, obviously they're, you know, you can't really say that that's the norm, right? I think that that's that's, right. not, that's no. definitely not the norm. No. Um, but I think that you know why why don't more companies aspire to that or actually do that in the in the in reality? I think it's because of what you just said there about time, energy, resources. Right. Um, and I, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is this huge misconception about what culture is. I mean, culture yeah. is not, you know, having a leadership retreat in Wyoming and picking out 10 core values and putting them on the website and telling the rest of your team and organization that, Hey, we have our culture now, That's right. you know, culture is not, you know, you get off on Thursdays at three forty-five PM and you can wear whatever you want to work. And you come to the office on Tuesdays and you work from home three days a week. And those are perks. That's right. You know, and I, I think along the, the way, a lot of leaders confused p- workplace perks with culture, culture and the seals know this better than anybody. Culture is at its core behavior at scale. That's right. How are the people on this team or within this organization behaving when the leader, when the coach, or when the CEO is not present in the room? Yeah. Yeah. And most it's, of most of what people would think of culture is actually um, just the what's on the surface. Right. And it's like the it's like the iceberg, you know, kind of analogy. Most of culture is actually below the surface. It's hidden right. from view. It's the biases, it's the, it's the assumptions, it's the expectations, it's all the, it's all the stuff that's behind the, you know, behind right. the skin of the individuals. And, and so because it's hidden from view, often it doesn't get attention. Right. So, but as I, I make a, you know, rally cry in the book that, I mean, it really is, even though it's below the surface, it also connects the dots to everything above the surface, right? right. If you're having retain, you know, you're having your trouble retaining your top talent culture, right? If you're having trouble to attracting top talent, culture related, if you're having leadership issues and character flaws, right? There's a cultural aspect there. If you're having execution mishaps, right? And not competing in the market like you were five years ago, there's a cultural mishap somewhere, right? right? right. So, I mean, everything some way, shape or form is connected to culture. It's not one thing, it's everything. That's right. And I, I think that, that enough leaders, the best leaders understand that, you know, and I think that they're able to do it in a way where uh, I think a lot of leaders, when they talk about it, it's more, you know, this is soft. I don't want to do soft. Like you said, it's very hard for them to be authentic or vulnerable. And they think that is what culture is connected to that. That is a part of it, but that is not culture to its core. You know, culture is, you know, not only behavior at scale, but it is the foundational mechanism in the core, the root that is helped, supposed to help that team and that organization really execute in the marketplace. That's right. And, and leaders, it's very easy to, you see something. So you want to address the symptom and think that you're going to, you know, you're handling it, but the right. underlying cause is that culture and the culture really is the DNA of an organization. And so you right. got to get, you got to change the DNA, right? You, right. Can't, you don't change, you don't, you don't just slop off a hand and replace the hand. You got to, you got to change right. the DNA. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is, what do you think is the, you know, the, the elements of the DNA of culture or are the elements? You know, so in the book, I, I lay out, you know, my five step, you know, process as far as how do you go in and cultivate, you know, configure, transform, change, or even build, you know, culture, whether it's weak, whether it's, it's good, but we have certain aspects that we need to transform into weak, or what if we have a great culture, but we want to accelerate even further, you know, and, and we won't have the time to go in through all five, but, sure. you know, the very first part of, of the element is defining your culture, mm-hmm. you know, and part of that is, you know, what I mean by that is you look at a lot of companies, regardless of what industry, they have mission statements, vision statements. But if let's say you see 20 employees that work at the same company at a conference and you approach those 20 employees and you ask them, what is your culture at XYZ company? Nine out of 10 times, you're going to get 19 different responses. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And to me, that's a huge gap because not only is that going to slow down the speed and the urgency of which we have to move in the market as a team, but also there's, there's lack of clarity about what makes us us. How are we unique? Mm-hmm. Because we may be telling our customers, suppliers and clients, how we're unique and why they should go with us. But do our people understand what makes us unique and what makes this a really inspiring and captivating workplace? And I think for me, I mean, it really does come down to you have to define your culture. 
you know, not not in the sense of where it has to be robotic, where all 20 employees mm -hmm. simultaneously say this is our culture, but they're able to articulately lay out, you know, this is what it means to work at XYZ company. This is what we stand for. This is what we're trying to do. And this is how we're going to compete in the market. And most importantly, these are the values that we live every single day. Right. You know, and I think that when you have that understanding and that clarity, that's when you start to create a momentum you know, is what you were talking about, you know, under that core, under the surface, which really kind of creates magic. Yeah. So, so vision, mission are still important, but it really is Absolutely. the, the values which lead to uh, expectations and behavioral norms that, that right. is really the soft underbelly, I would say. Right. Right. Because a lot, and even a lot of people now, I think that they say, you know, well, okay, well, how do you define culture, right? And I talk about in the book, like creating a cultural purpose statement, what that is. And, you know, some companies, you know, replace their mission statement with it, or, you know, that's not really the intent of it, but it's, yeah. it's just that, hey, here's something that's worked for a lot of organizations, as far as how do you define your culture? Mm -hmm. And then also on the flip side of that, you know, it's really drilling down that, you know, this is, you know, your, your serving mechanism to really accelerate the behaviors at scale. Mm -hmm. Because, a lot of people will even say to this day now, Mark, and you probably hear this as well, you can't just have core values, but you got to live those values or okay. you got to, you got to bring those values to life. True. But it also has to be routine. Right. It has to be second nature. It mm -hmm. has to be ingrained in the organization. Like you said, I mean, it's the DNA because a lot mm -hmm. of times what we see is we see some of the time behaviors right. where we're not going for some of the time behaviors. We're going for all the time behaviors, automatic behaviors. Right. Yeah, I love that. Um, so a couple of things here, because um, I think this is so important. You know, I, I uh, have a saying that the team is the new leader and ultimately people, you know, are not human resources. They are the main thing in an organization. And yet, you know, we have toxic cultures. We have quiet quitting. We have mass you know, resignation going on. We have um, all sorts of uh, de de degradation of trust and um, and unity through remote work, right? Like there's a crisis, a culture crisis going on in organizations, I think, in at least in America and the West. So how do, first of all, how do, what, do you, what do you think about that? Am I right? And um, what, do we, what do we do about it? Right? What, I think you are right. And I see it. You know, and, and I think that, I think number one, and I think you're starting to get a lot of leaders that are getting better and improving this area, but I think that, you know, understanding how significant and important it is to highlight the employee voice. And what I mean by that is really, you know, letting them know that their opinion counts, right? You know, that, Hey, we don't want people to complain and just, you know, make excuses or kind of, you know, have this be a complaint session, but we do want to hear people of, you know, what do you like about working at this organization? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what, what can we improve and tweak in this organization to make this be a more fulfilling workplace? You know, right. are we giving you the resources and tools to help you be a better father, a better mother to go out in the world and, you know, really attract two causes that are special to your heart and your personal life? You know, mm -hmm. and, and I think with the leaders that understand the significance of that, that connect a deeper purpose to what they do in the business world, in, the, in that sense, in the market, but then also understanding that, you know, we're not just in a business to use our people to build our business. We're in business to use our business to build our people. I love that. And there's a very, very clear distinction between the two. And sure. I, I think that the leaders that understand the difference between that, right, they're the ones that not only retain top talent, but they attract top talent. Those are the leaders that when they do retire, their retirement parties are some of the biggest parties that you've ever seen. Um, and I think those are the companies that build the legacies and the dynasties that can and continually dominate and build those foundations that you kind of talked about in the beginning. I love that. That's, that's such a great statement. Use our people to build a business or use the business to build our people. We've been right. toying with, uh, we use this um, model called the deliberately developmental organization in with some of our client work, which is exactly the latter, like where the organization becomes the petri dish for the growth of all the, all the employees, right? right? You go to work to grow. And through your growth and your collaboration and the team's growth, then the company is able to perform uh, a, a better job serving its customers and, you know, being creative and spontaneous and adaptive right. and resilient, right? So it's all about the people. That's awesome. It is. And a lot of it too, I mean, you, you, I know you've seen this, you know, a lot of it is, you know, I think a lot of leaders, when they hear that, right, they think, oh my gosh, that's so much work. We, you know, we're already, you know, the three-year, you know, target. We, got, we have no time for this. Nobody yeah, got we have no time for this. Like, come on in. <laughs> But it's, I'll, I'll never, ever forget 
So at the beginning of COVID in 2020, I was working with a, you know, one CEO and, you know, very beloved, very, very respected. Um, you know, he was at the company for 25 years. Uh, he was getting ready to retire, which he just did last year. But in 2020, he had no, no idea what was in store for his future. But I'll never forget when his whole entire workforce, right, all 5,000 employees started working at home. And he completely freaked out. He lost his mind. He said, man, I have no idea how to do this. Like, how do you connect? You know, we're having these Zoom calls every single week to fill in our people. And, you know, they're having personal issues. Their children are at, are at home. And just what, you know, how does this happen? I will never, ever forget him sitting in on one meeting. And I told him, I said, in this particular meeting, I want you to talk about the fire that your family just had. He had a family, uh, a, a, a fire that basically tore down one of his houses. Wow. Um, and, you know, I'll never forget. And he was, he looked at me and said, I'm not doing that. Like that's, that's too personal. And like, that just happened. I'm not ready to talk about that. Long story short, Mark, he, he ended up doing it on that particular moment, right? Everyone has no idea what's going on with the world. Everyone's working from home. They're telling us the world's ending. I will never forget five minutes after that Zoom call ended, he called me almost, you know, shaken up a little bit and said, I wish I understood the importance of this 25 years ago. Yes. Wow. And cool. just that, that simple thought of sharing, right? You being yeah. the leader of the organization, sharing about a personal hardship and trial while all your people are very, they're, you know, the uncertainty of the future is very relevant right now. And everyone has no idea what's going, going, going to happen. This is right in the start of COVID. Right. Um, and it, it was just such a powerful moment. And from that day forward, I saw a leader completely transform his leadership style because he took a chance. He was more vulnerable in that specific situation. But the reason why I share this with you is because after that situation of even him being more vulnerable, what he started to do more of was asking people, not just about how are you doing at work, yeah. but how is your family doing? How are your sons doing? How are your grandchildren doing? And him just highlighting the employee voice just created an exponential domino effect throughout the organization. That's awesome. You know, um, DEI and kind of woke culture is a big hot potato button. Uh, I know from research that having a diverse and inclusive um, environment is really beneficial. Yep. Um, but, but it's controversial in terms of how it's deployed. And so we're seeing that, you know, after George Floyd, you know, everyone was hiring DEI officers. And then I just read an article today that like, most of them have either been transitioned out or, or, or left the organizations right. and were left back with a bunch of, a bunch of white dudes in DEI positions. So it kind of, to me, I looked at that and said, you know what, that's, that's cause they're like putting a bandaid or, or trying to move a lever at the top of the iceberg when right. it was really something that needs to be done at a much deeper, deeper level at a heartfelt level, as opposed to a, Hey, you know, let's put a little, uh, wrapper on it and, and pretend that we're, we're an inclusive and, and, uh, diverse organization. What, what's your um, kind of view on all that? The, the pros and cons of DEI initiatives and, and where we stand? You know, I think that D and I think that's the problem right there is I think DE and I, I it can't be an initiative. It's got to be the core of who you are connected to your culture, the foundational right. basis of your company. You right. know, I think that if you think that this is something that you have to do because the shareholders are forcing you to, or because you read an article in Harvard Business Review about how important DNI is and, you know, how the board will be very upset with you if you don't hire XYZ amount of, um, you know, minorities. I, I think that you'll never get off the ground running into where you want to go. I think the organizations that do a very good job of it understand the complexity of the situation, but they also connect it to their very core. Right. And I think when it's viewed as an initiative, just like when culture is viewed as an initiative, you know, the, the, the results are not longstanding. And I think right. that at the end of the day, this isn't something that's a hot topic. This isn't something that should, I mean, it's, it's proven in the data, it's proven in the research and even me, you know, like how my life has benefited by being an athlete with people who, you know, don't look like me. They didn't grow up like me. They mm -hmm. don't have the resources that I had when I was younger growing up that my parents were able to provide for me. I mean, some of my teammates used to eat out of trash cans, you know, when they were six years old. Wow. Um, you know, and what that does in a team environment, being able to connect and kind of bring that all to the table as one connected team is just astronomical. Yeah. Um, so I do think the athlete in me uh, has accelerated the understanding a little bit more. But I think to answer your question specifically, Mark, it, it can't be an initiative. It's got to be the very core. And if yeah. you don't believe in it fully now, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's doing the research. It's understanding about how it can impact 
business right. performance, but you also can't just do it for business performance. You got to right. do it because, you it's know, right sure, thing. it's the right thing to do, but, you know, it's more about, you know, it, it, that's how you build a great team. It's not about where people come from or their, their skin color or their, their, their resources or lack of it. It's that we want to build the people, the organization of, of what we're trying to do and carry out the mission. And at the end of the day, it has nothing to do about any of those, those factors. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's, it's gotta be part and parcel of, you know, the organization from the bottom up, you know, I saw a study once that there, you know, th there's three basic types of, um, organizations when it comes to diversity. One is homogeneous, right? And a lot of people think, well, the SEALs must be really homogeneous because they're all, you know, hardcore physical. And I'm like, well, in a sense, there's like homogeneity of capability in a certain narrow range, right? Physical aptitude, you know, emotional resiliency, but there's radical diversity in the terms of, you know, race, religion, you know, everything, right? Ethnicity and and, and socioeconomic status, right? Radical diversity, just like you had, as you described with, with the football teams. And so that organization is actually radically diverse and extremely effective, right? Right. The third, so, so then a more homogeneous organization would be like, um, you know, like a Boston police department, right? Where everyone's a, a, like a, a, a white, you know, Catholic, right? <laughs> From the neighborhood. <laughs> That's very homogeneous. <laughs> and they right. can be very effective, but they're going to be less effective than the radically diverse and inclusive organization like the SEALs. And then right. the one in between, the least effective, is one that is diverse but not inclusive. Meaning like right. like kind of like the corporation that is trying to staff based upon meeting certain numbers or quotas or, you know, kind of expectation or even image, but there's no real inclusion of everyone's voice. Right. Absolutely. And you know, I, I think quite frankly, I mean, there's a lot of companies that may not even be, let's say, diverse from if you look at their employee sheet and look at all the contacts and the people that work within that company. But, you know, even even if that they don't have that in their their core with their people, there's still no site of inclusiveness within the organization. Right. So I think it's understanding that D E and I is not just about hiring you right. know, and giving the opportunities to minorities and having X, Y, Z amount of percentage, you know, hired this month and next month. I mean, it's also living and breathing and driving inclusiveness in the workplace, right? You know, truly building a inclusion, you know, effort day in and day out. And that's, that is really, I mean, that's a day to day thing. That is not right. just an initiative, you know, that's gotta be, you know, almost fanatical about that. Uh, well, and that, I, you know, back, back to the, 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 the toxicity of like wokeism. Inclusion means including everybody. Exactly. Not just the ones who are, you know, not just the minorities or the ones who right. are, you know, considered um, non-included, right? So it means including everybody because you could, you could literally swing things the radically the other way, which is what happened in our culture and exclude, right? The whites or the whoever, Absolutely. right? You know, who, who you, whoever you, you know, think was the problem causer and, and that makes it worse. But I do think leaders, they have a tremendous, you know, I, I always say leadership is a tremendous responsibility. It is. Yeah. And I, I think that because of that notion and, and idea and reality, you know, you also have a certain level of, I, I think, you know, you, there, there's some level of intentionality you have to have to dig a little bit deeper to understand and sympathize also with a certain demographic that may have experienced hardships that we That's haven't. Right. For sure. You know, and I think that, it, it, listen, I, it's very tough to do. I think that there's, there's so many com complexities around that, um, especially if you're not from that you know, from the, you didn't grow up like them. You don't, you don't understand that. Like the whole George Floyd thing. I've seen leaders, uh, you know, do a tremendous thing with, when that, you know, crisis happened. I've seen leaders that maybe missed the mark there. That's right. You know, and I think that at the end of the day, it was the leaders that truly understood not only the importance of driving inclusiveness, but it really was at their core foundational idea and belief of what they wanted to build for that organization. That's fantastic. I agree with that. Yeah. You know, ultimately it's about, perspective, right? Being able to be, to take the perspective of others and then to take the, the diverse perspective of your team and to create an entirely new uh, perspective as well as a collective perspective, as well as understanding, right. shared understanding and shared vision out of that, which is uh, something that could never have happened without that diversity, right? And I think that's what makes uh, the power for a really strong culture is is the multitude of perspectives coming together to create something radically new that couldn't have existed. Absolutely. 
And that's really how you unleash creativity. That's how you unleash, you know, innovation is you want to get people that, you know, do not grow up like you. I think there's this huge need, you know, to, you know, we want to get people like us. We want to get people, you know, when we go into a meeting and have 25 people, they all look like us, sound like us and have the same experiences. You know, I tell leaders all the time, like you should look in your meeting rooms and look to your right and left. And, you know, you want a drastic difference and outlook on life. Uh, and I've seen the companies that do that, right? Like they maybe have restricted, you know, some of their hiring policies in the past, but now they they do look at former inmates. You know, they do look at opportunities with people, maybe backgrounds, right? And, and, and their ability to attract top talent because maybe one simple move such as that and give people a second chance or third chance at the game of life and give them an opportunity has not only paid off for the, those people in their life, but it's paid off tremendously for the organization. You know, because they're getting people who think in a different way, who are able to bring a certain level of new creativity and innovation that maybe the 55, 65 year old white male has never experienced or even thought of in their own life and journey, right. regardless right. of how successful they may be. May be. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I was just at a group meeting yesterday and, you know, hiring, you know, hiring is a big deal right now for people that hiring people who have the, you know, the, the autonomy and the, the um, the confidence to go get it right to get after it as opposed to being you know just an intermediary you know or or having to be told what to do it's very very difficult it has nothing to do with skills or intelligence it has everything to do with integrity and character but right. i think the reason you know the reason that so many people are quitting and saying there's toxic cultures is because the organizations were treating them like cogs in the wheel or intermediaries or you know what i mean like like resources and so this is why you know, if you're having trouble hiring, take a look at your culture first, because obviously you're not attracting the A players. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, you know, I always, like I say in the book, I mean, who, who drives the culture for the most part, it is the team at its core, but it's also the leaders, right? right? You can't change culture if the leaders first don't go and lead the way forward. And I think at the end of the day, people don't leave organizations, they leave bad managers. Right. And, you know, I think that that is the leadership crisis that America has faced. And I think is continuing to face a little bit. I think you're starting to see a shift there, but I, I do think there still is a managerial crisis because of that. And I think that is why you've seen that. Uh, you know, I think people leaving and they're looking for a new opportunity. And, you know, I think it's part of it, you know, just like kind of like football, like a piece of meat, like, hey, you're here to do a job and it's almost robotic. There's no part of like, hey, how's your daughter doing? Or, you know, you, you just lost a parent, like, sure, take off the week and, you know, we'll cover for you. You know, you're a teammate. So we want you to be able to grieve and be with your family. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen companies that said, no, you better get back here on Wednesday to go back to work. We got a big client meeting the next day, right? right? I mean, there's just no empathy in that. And I think that at the end of the day, Mark, I mean, what we're talking about here is simply just be, be a good person. Be a good person. <laughs> yeah. Be a good company. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Culture is the way. I, I think that's great work. I really applaud you for it. And Matt, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining me today. Where can people learn more about the book and your work? Thanks so much for having me, Mark. It's, it's really been a great pleasure and I've really enjoyed this discussion. Um, the best place to connect with me is probably my website, mattmayberryonline.com. And I'm on all the social media platforms, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. You know, there's so many now. I feel like I lose I know, track right? of all of them. It's hard to keep track. Um, but yeah, all social media platforms, Matt underscore Mayberry. You can find me there. And then my book uh, is on available on Amazon. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Great work and I appreciate your time. And what a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mark. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Yeah, you're welcome.